Welcome to the finance meeting for September 18th. Mr. Uh, Chairman, before we start the, uh, the evening tonight, we've, uh, since we last uh, met, we lost two great Brocktonians here in the city of Brockton. And I think uh, the council, they were friends of the council, Dr. Francis Ficero and Mr. George Kerr. And uh, Dr. Ficero, everybody knows, uh, great medical doctor here in the city of Brockton, great Brocktonian, father-in-law of Deputy Brian Nardelli. And uh, he and his, his, uh, his family should be in our thoughts. And uh, Mr. George Kerr, uh, who uh, everybody knew as a volunteer with his wife Joan here in the city of Brockton. If you ever heard George sing, it was like an angel singing. So I'd like to take a, a moment of uh, silence for those two gentlemen. They will be missed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council. And they rest in peace. Thank you. Madam Clerk, item number one. Appointment, Michael F. Dosh, 138 Birchview Ave, Brockton, as a trustee <coughs> of the War Memorial Building in the City of Brockton for a three-year term ending August 2016. <coughs> Invited Michael F. Dosh. Good evening, Mr. Dosh. Good evening, Mr. President. Council's Move for a favorable recommendation second. of full council. Motion made and seconded. Mr. President, I mean, oh, the Mr. Motion. Chairman, on the motion, I just wanted to congratulate you and thank you for your service uh, to the city in this new capacity, and I know it will be We'll make very good use of your talent, so thank you for I really appreciate that. It's a, it's a great privilege to be invited to, to be here. I did serve in the Marine Corps. I was in for about 23 years. I made first sergeant, and, uh, and I'd love to do something to give back to uh, my Marine Corps and my veteran community. I know there are a few veterans that are on the council tonight, and we appreciate their service as well. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman, on the motion. Council Brophy. Uh, I just want to congratulate you, uh, Attorney Dash. Uh, and uh, remembering you at, as a classmate of Cardinal Spellman, we were all happy that you went into the Marine Corps because it kind of calmed you down a bit. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for your kind words, Mr. Brophy. Yeah. But congratulations. You're out of order. <laughs> Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably to the full city council. Thank you, Mr. Right, thank you, Mr. President. Item number two. Appointment, Monica Vaz Tavares, 573 North Montella Street, Brockton, as a member of the Brockton Cultural Council for a three-year term ending August 2016, invited Monica Vaz Tavares. Good evening, Ms. Vaz Tavares. Councilors? Move well, for a favorable recommendation. Second. Second. So on, on the motion, Mr. Chairperson, motion, I happen to know Ms. Tavares as well. Uh, excited that more people are participating in city government, and uh, thank you for your service and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Motion made and second, seconded to uh, recommend to the City Council favorably. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank you and good luck. Thank you. Item number three. Appointment. Sander J. Brockter, 140 Colonel Bell Drive, Apartment 204, Brockton, to the Housing Authority Board of Commissioners for a term of five years ending August 2018. Invited Sandra Proctor. Good evening, Ms. Proctor. How are you? Good evening. I'd Folks, like I recommend to favorably to the full council. I'd actually like to take a moment to also uh, Note that we have our new, newly elected uh, executive director of the Brockton Housing Authority here tonight, Tom Tebow, and I know he'll do a great job. Thank you. <laughs> mighty big shoes to fill, though. Motion is made uh, second and to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank you and good luck, Ms. Proctor. Thank you. Item number four. Reappointment, Paul Sullivan, 451 East Ashland Street, Brockton, to the License Commission for a term of three years, ending August 2016, invited Paul Sullivan. Council DiNapoli. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Sullivan is a little under the weather uh, this evening and couldn't be here with us tonight, but uh, everybody knows uh, Red Sullivan. He has his own seat at the City Council, and he has been on many, many boards across the city, so I... I wish him a uh, happy birthday tomorrow, and I hope he feels better. And motion to uh, recommend favorably to the position. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Item number five. Reappointment. William Sharnick, 17 Sipikin Road, Wareham, as a constable in the city of Brockton for a three-year term. Invited William E. Sharnick. Good evening, Mr. Sharnick. Good evening, Mr. President. Councilors? Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Second. Motion made and seconded. Uh, on the motion. Councilor Sullivan. Mr. Shonick, uh, just one quick question. How long have you been a, a constable here in the city of Brockton? Uh, approximately 40 years, sir. And, and you have, you have a, a Massachusetts license to carry a firearm? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Motion is made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? 
Opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shannock. Item number six. Reappointment. Paul Sullivan, 451 East Ashland Street, Brockton, to the Planning Board for a term of five years, ending August 2018. Invited Paul Sullivan. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Second. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably to the full City Council. Item number seven. Order appropriation 315,586 from the Massachusetts Executive Office of the Public Safety and Security 911 Department grant to the City of Brockton Police Department Regional Emergency Communications Center Support and Incentive Grant Fund. These funds will be used to backfill both ETD and police dispatch wages incurred from 8-12-13 to 6-30-14 for any associated overtime costs to replace that same personnel as well as funds to install a recently purchased ETD computer consoles, invited Johnny Conn, Chief Financial Officer, Emmanuel C. Gomes, Chief of Police. Good evening, Chief. Good evening. Maybe give a little explanation. A little, that was pretty, uh, pretty thorough in the order. So, yeah, it's just changing out some infrastructure and uh, changing out the 911 communication system, as uh, we have some mandated upgrades that we have to take care of. Make a oh, favorable recommendation. Second. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank you, Chief. Item number eight. What are appropriation? $22,030 from the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency, EMPG, Performance Grant Program to the Brockton Emergency Management Agency, BEMA. To the Brockton Emergency Management Agency intends to use these grant funds for installation of satellite receivers, radios, multiplexer antennas, and associated cables. Invited John A. Conn, Chief Financial Officer, Morton Shelford, Director of Emergency Management. Good evening. Good evening, what? Move to recommend favorable. Second. Second. Napoli. Uh, on, on, the, on the motion. Good evening, Mr. Sir. How are you this evening? Very it good. seems that uh, since uh, you, you've been involved in this, uh, we've received quite a few grants, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's too bad your department is a little bit, you know, a little bit short on how much money you have in your budget, but $22,000 is great. Well, we've, we've been in okay. close to $100,000, but we've been working very closely with both police and fire and on that new radio program, and that's where the money is going. It's a wonderful thing. We need it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Brophy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Shuffler. Um, is there a match in this grant? Or is no. It? Okay. No. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Brophy. Motion has been made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full City Council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Item number nine. Order appropriation of 45000 from the Executive Office of <coughs> Health and Human Services, Massachusetts Department of Mental Health, Police-Based Jail Diversion Grant for 2014 to the City of Brockton Police Department Jail Diversion Grant Fund. The purpose of the grant is to avoid arrest where possible to people with mental illness or emotional disturbance. Invited John A. Conan, Chief Financial Officer, Emmanuel C. Gomes, Chief of Police. Good evening, Chief. Good evening. Uh, once again, it, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. This is a... Uh, a program where uh, rather than bring people with mental illnesses into the criminal justice system, this is a diversion program. It involves people of uh, mental health background, get these people the service that they need rather than get into the uh, criminal justice system. Motion recommend favorably. Second. Second. Council Brophy. On the motion. Uh, Chief, um, prior to going to law school, <coughs> I uh, worked over at um, Multi Service Center in the crisis unit and uh, uh, many times uh, the officers would, in dealing with people with mental illnesses, would just bring them directly to us. And there may be, have been other issues involved, uh, but um, there was a reluctance at that point for the officers to deal with that individual. And uh, so I'm really happy to see this uh, program being in place in Brockton because unfortunately a lot of the people that your <coughs> officers deal with, are, are de you're dealing with uh, mental illness and knowing how to appropriately deal with, um, with this population uh, will result, I think, in less arrest and, and uh, a, uh, a move toward care of these individuals. Right, that's the, that's, that's, that's the, uh, the target uh, here on, on this case. There are a lot of people who don't, don't necessarily deserve to be in a criminal justice system, but sometimes uh, there aren't any alternatives. This is one of those alternatives to deal with that. Great. Thank you, Chief. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Motion has been made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full City Council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank you, Chief. Item number 10. 
Order appropriation three million five hundred and ninety six thousand dollars from the stabilization fund one thousand eight hundred one million eight hundred ninety six thousand to the fire department personal services other than overtime one point seven four million fire department overtime one hundred fifty six thousand in order to fund the proposed fiscal year fourteen cost of a separate contract settlement with the same union for the period of fiscal year fourteen fifteen and sixteen also recommending an additional appropriation from the stabilization fund one point seven million to the fire department of personal services other than overtime one million five hundred eighty five thousand fire department overtime one hundred and fifteen thousand. The parties have agreed that both contracts must receive funding approval for the provisions of either contract to be effective. Invited Honorable Mayor Linda Belzotti, John A. Conan, Chief Financial Officer, Richard C. Francis, Chief of Fire, Maureen Cruz, Director of Personnel, Caitlin Leach, Assistant City Solicitor, Catherine Federoff, Assistant City Solicitor. Councilors, I do have a letter in hand. Attorney Federoff was unable to be here, but uh, Attorney Leach is here. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Councilors. I'm going to make a few uh, brief comments and then questions that you have regarding financing or whatever. Mr. Condon will be happy to answer and any language questions either the Chief or Mr. Condon can answer. Um, as many of you know, we've been at the table with the um, uh, firefighters for almost four years. Um, and I don't think that either side would object if I said that at points the negotiations for this contract got a little bit contentious and that a couple times they almost broke apart and then you throw in the added um, curveball or wrench in terms of um, having to deal with the issue of health insurance and negotiating that as well. So it took a very, very long time to reach this agreement. Um, I know that there's some, been some concern about the retroactive portion of this agreement, but it was clear that we were not going to come to an agreement with the firefighters unless there was some retroactive package. Uh, so to make that uh, advantageous for the city side as well, we negotiated so we have the three years going forward. So we have um, something set up to work with the um, other unions on. I would like you to keep in mind also that had we not come to some form of agreement that both public safety unions, uh, both police officers and firefighters, have an opportunity that other unions don't have available to them, and that is to go to the Joint Labor Management Commission. Very rarely when you come out of that does the municipality come out in favor. So for us, the goal was to try to reach an agreement, which we did. And um, I hope you will also keep in mind, based on the information that you have provided, that um, part of the uh, issues in dealing and, and get, taking so long to reach this agreement was that there was precedent set with other union agreements in the city at the school department level in trying to make this all work. Um, there was a lot of hard work done on both sides. I want to thank my team and I want to thank the team from the firefighters uh, union as well. They worked hard. There were, trust me, there were a lot, a lot, a lot of hours put into this. And there were periods where things did break down a little bit, and I don't think that any side, either side would deny that. But we have gotten to this agreement, and um, it is agreement that goes for another three years after. So uh, I think it is advantageous for the city, and I hope that you will support it. And I'd be happy to answer any questions, but if there are specifics regarding financing, I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna ask Mr. Condon to take care of those. Councilor Monahan. Yes, good evening, Mayor. I suppose uh, Mr. Connor can answer this. Just one question. <clears throat> this money we're appropriating is, is also covering uh, fiscal years 15 and 16? No, the That's appropriation not. is not for 15 and 16. It's okay. for fiscals 11, 12, 13, and 14, and all the retroactive elements to that. 15 and 16 are now uh, agreed to uh, if this contract is funded, but the cost for those will be in the subsequent budgets. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Stewart. Uh, thank you. Uh, Madam Mayor, I have a, a general question for you and then a number of questions for the CFO and others. Mm -hmm. um, so politically speaking, in this political environment, we have a situation where there's just a lot of angst out there around tax increases and then pay raises on, mm -hmm. at the same time. Um, what's your sort of argument for this level of 
pay increases of this amount. I'm not certain the level has increased it's, it's, well, with the I backdrop think of I, tax increases. I think I um, discussed it in the few minutes that I spoke to you that um, there is precedent with uh, salary increases that were given to the teachers union. Actually, the teachers union got 10 and a half um, percent increases over four years. This is 11. Uh, 0.75 over six years, so it's actually less than the teachers got. Um, and unfortunately, when you have situations where other unions agree or, or get something, then the, the other <coughs> unions are going to be looking for um, the same thing. But I think what folks have to keep in mind also is that um, they receive services from these men and women every single day if they are injured, hurt, their house is burning down, Whatever it is, these are the folks that answer the call. And I, I would prefer to have uh, members of our fire department who have contracts negotiated and are um, comfortable working rather than have arbitration and ugliness and a lot of other things that can come with a lack of a contract. And I do also think that if you average it out, which I think has been presented to you in the, pap in the papers that you've been given in the information, it is every year when you average it out, it is less, some years are less than 2% and they're all less than the cost of living. So while I understand that many people would um, be concerned about this, it is something that has been in negotiation for almost four years. And that's a long time. And then and this may be a question, I have a, a lot of concerns about this, so I have, I don't no, know no, my, that's I, fine. my colleagues, um, I, I don't want to dominate the conversation, so I may the floor. Um, give up the floor at some point, but um, so and I spoke to, to the uh, chief financial officer about this. He gave me a comparison of this agreement with other union agreements, um, and so this the precedent you're using with the teachers union to so I'm assuming the teachers union agreement was made, and then the the unions see that agreement and bargain against it essentially. Mm -hmm. How does that impact? Um, the agreements that were made with other unions previously and then also just moving forward because <laughs> you're if we're setting precedent what with does that this look agreement like forward? well the uh, what we feel is that the going forward we have the three-year base now the three-year forward that the fire department has agreed to and we think that that will help us in in working with the other unions to agree I don't want to obviously say too much because then I will be get an unfair labor um, so you don't, you know, you don't bargain in public, but obviously we've set precedent with the fire department for the three years going forward that um, will be, I'm sure, utilized in dealing with the other unions in the city. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then what's the, the, in terms of departments within the city, um, where do the firefighters rank in terms of average pay compared to other departments? And then where does this fire department rank in terms of other like cities in terms of pay? <laughs> For the municipal unions, I would say the average pay of the firefighters is probably the highest in the city. It's a little bit higher than some of the police officers because there's a compensation element in their pay for um, emergency medical services, which the police department doesn't provide, and they're, they're paid on the basis of certification, so they're probably the highest paid. Uh, in terms of city uh, department budgets, personnel services cost in department budgets, uh, they're also a little bit higher than the police department. Uh, so in both of those cases, they rank higher. Uh, in terms of the uh, school department, probably the highest paid union uh, on that side obviously would be the teachers, but their compensation level for the most part doesn't come to the same as the, uh, as the public safety unions on this side. But in terms of the total cost of that budget, it's more high, it's higher. Uh, with respect to their compensation levels, they are well compensated compared to other communities in the state. Uh, the larger cities, I don't think we're out of line with the larger cities with Boston, I think we're probably behind. The further west you move and the further south you move from the city of Boston, uh, the less influence there is on those contracts of the Boston contracts. And so if you're talking about maybe Springfield or west of Springfield, they wouldn't be compensated as highly as ours. Uh, our department is a well compensated department, I think. It's probably, is, uh, as well as that though, the busiest department on a per <coughs> capita basis uh, in terms of number of employees of any department in the state. And then, okay, and then I, I, obviously I support the fire department and our city workers, but th mm -hmm. this is like an, an enormous amount of money out of the stabilization fund. And I know part of my 
argument for the voting for the tax increases was that we wanted to keep the stabilization fund healthy, which impacts our bond rating, all this sort of stuff. So now we're coming in and, you know, consuming a lot of finances out of the stabilization fund. How does that impact uh, this idea of, of bond ratings and having enough money saved, put aside, and, and all that stuff? Well, my preference as chief financial officer would be that we would have a um, source to pay for this contract other than the stabilization fund. You know, I think everybody knows my argument. We need more than the stabilization fund. Uh, the city council chose a year ago not to appropriate fully to the stabilization fund in order to maintain a lower, a lower tax rate. I understand that decision, but the decision was made that way. Same thing in the budget. There was a cut made from the stabilization fund request. So uh, there's always some contention between what the level of reserve should be and what you're going to pay for out of your regular budget and how much you should tap into those reserves. This contract, because it has so many years of retroactivity, the biggest issue we're dealing with here is we didn't get to agreement. You know, had the firefighters been willing to settle for zeros, it would have been different, but they weren't. They felt they were deserving of increases in each of the years for which they'd not been paid. I, I can't argue with that argument in terms of the merits of it, in terms of the financial impact. I did argue against it. Oh, we can't, we can't, we can't. But we weren't going to get to a deal. So we were going to be in a position where, had we not chosen to come to some kind of an arrangement with this union, that there would have been a series of steps after that. And I don't know where it would have played out, but I have a strong... Uh, thought that in all likelihood we would have ended up going through mediation and fact-finding and getting in front of the Joint Labor Management Committee. That's a long and arduous process. It's really expensive. It's not free. There's staff time. There's outside council time. There's an impact on the, on the work relationship with a critical workforce, <coughs> all of that. And at the end of the day, as the mayor mentioned, there was no guarantee we would have done any better and probably would have done a little bit worse because that committee would have looked what are the settlements in other public safety unions around the state and what are the uh, contract settlements that the city was willing to pay to other critical workforces and they would have looked at that teacher's contract. The school department is in a very different situation. They've got a dedicated revenue stream coming in. Their revenue is going up from the state. Our revenue has been cut and maintained at a low level for 12 years, about $120 million accumulatively in cuts. All of those factor into it. My view is no deal was possible without the retroactivity. I don't think there was a better deal available to us at the table. I don't know that there would have a better deal available to us going past this into dispute mediation in the JLMC. And at the end of the day, we'd have been forced to probably pay these folks for the years that they got zeros. And that's, that's the basic reason we did. Impact on the bond rating, they won't like our tapping into that reserve fund at the rating agency. So I can state that unequivocally. That's not a thing they like to see. They'd be pre preferring to see us find a way to either pay for this through service reductions, if you're not going to pay through revenues, or find a way to replace those revenues that were taken from the stabilization fund over time to build it back up. That would be their preference. And if this were to go to arbitration and they came back unfavorably for the city, or, but we're still not bound by that agreement, right? It still has to be a vote by the city council to That's appropriate right. the funds, You're correct? absolutely right, council. There is a binding, a JLMC recommendation is binding on the chief executive of the city. So the mayor would be forced. We'd make a case. You know, we'd, it's kind of like a tribunal. and We'd make a recommendation for some settlement. But whatever settlement emerged, whether it was like this, less expensive or more expensive, would be binding upon the union negotiating team to bring back to its membership for a vote. But it also would have been binding on the chief executive of the city to bring before the city council and endorse it, not just bring it forward, but to actively engage in arguing for it. But there is no binding portion of that on the city council. The city council is an independent player in that and can make its own vote as the council members see fit. And if that were to happen, so if, if, to, if this contract were not approved by the city council and we went through this arbitration process and it still were not approved, uh, what happens at that point? Well, I, I, I don't know for sure, but I would think that if, let's assume that tonight or next, uh, next time you come to an actual vote as opposed to a recommendation, the contract fails to get the necessary eight votes for funding. Uh, we'd be back to the table. I don't know what would emerge, but I still think we'd probably end up at that point in front of the JLMC. I do think the JLMC would be somewhat informed, not just by other settlements in the state and other settlements in the city, but by a vote of the city council to refuse to fund this particular deal. I don't think they could ignore it because they've got to come back again to the, exactly. to the council for, for a subsequent vote. Uh, so the idea of this 2%, so I understand it's actually more cost effective if you take the, the, those years and combine 2% at once versus 2% on top of 2% each year. So we're saving money, I think, if I understand the math correctly, by this particular package. Is that correct? 
Um, no, I'm not sure I, 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 I agree with that. I really don't know what, what, you, what you were meaning by that. But by doing the retroactivity, you're saying it's, it's 2011 is the first year of the contract. Well, their current pay is based on the 2010, the last year of their old agreement. Current budget is based on 2010. All the budgets after 2010, 11, 12, 13 were based on the 2010 rates. So when you agree, just to make this simple, when you agree for 2%, for fiscal 11, retroactive and carrying forward, you're really agreeing for those four years to 8%. It's two for 11 and two for 12 and two for 13 and two for 14, there's 8%. Then you're doing the same thing for fiscal 12, except it's 6%, it's three years, 12, 13, and 14. And then for you know, the next year it's four, the next year it's two, when you add them all up, in the aggregate, they're getting a total of about 12% in the amount of pay going to them, you know, their pay rates, but in the amount of compensation that's coming to them because you're making up for all those zero years, you know, you're paying over 20%. That's, and that's why it's so expensive. I understand. And it's the retroactivity that's doing it. No retroactivity would not nearly be as expensive. And is it, it, it struck me as curious, even in the previous agreement with the city made where um, so if I were at a company in 2011 and that company, for whatever, for whatever fiscal reasons, uh, could not afford pay raises, it seemed unusual to me to come back several years later to say I would want the pay increases from the previous years when, when there was not funding in place to do that. How usual is that in, in Well, I don't, think it's, I don't think it's unusual at all that they've done that. I don't know of any union which is looking to accept as a settlement a zero year for any year. And if uh, I think... Now, the union can speak for itself, but I think in their view, uh, it's the responsibility of the city to find a way to pay them for the years that we didn't. And the fact that there's uh, zero year of any kind in there is the city's obligation to fix, not theirs. I don't want to make their argument for them, but I think that's the guts of their argument. You know, we're working for you. You know, we're, we're seeing our costs go up. We're seeing in the ensuing years, not only our costs go up, but what's coming out of our paycheck also go up in terms of health costs, even before the most recent settlement. And so we need, in order to maintain our circumstances, we need some kind of compensation for each of those years. And their basic view was, just because you managed to get other unions to agree to accept those zeros in exchange only for a one-time bonus that didn't have any retroactive element, it doesn't mean you can expect to get that out of this union. We're a larger union, and we're more insistent on what we think is fair to us, and they're also going to look at the fact that we didn't get to a settlement with the police patrolman union on the basis of those other contract settlements either. So, you can, you know, so both of the biggest public safety unions said no to that other pattern. This isn't unusual. It's just unusual to go this many years. And the reason we've gone this many years, I think, is two. One, we are constrained for revenues. Whether folks like that or not, it's, it's true. We're, we're, we're in tight circumstances, and we've got costs that are going up, and state aid on this side of government, which isn't, just, just fact, not going up. That hurts us. Cost going up in the face of that also hurts us. And then, well, several years of zeros. We had health insurance going on, negotiations going on at the same time. So the city was attempting to get some of those zero years funded by health insurance concessions. In the middle of all, they were resistant to that. They weren't saying no. It was a contentious negotiation. But in the middle of all of that, the state passed the health insurance reform law. That blew it all up. We had to go back to zero. We brought a proposal to the city council, which would have walked away from collective bargaining. The city council did not like that approach. They said, you need to do this through the negotiating process. So we're back at the table to get first. The negotiation for the health insurance on a, on a settlement basis with everybody, delayed them again, and then we're finally back at the table. So this four years is not typical. Um, I can recall, I've been here 20 odd years, I can recall one other time when we had this much uh, of a gap in getting to a settlement with the unions, but never four years. It's, it, it's, a, it's a big period, and it's unfortunate that it happened, but it did, and now we're paying for it. Okay, great. Uh, two more questions, and yeah. I will give up the floor. The, um, so when the health care was negotiated, the unions created some sort of collaborative to bargain as a unit, if I understand that process correctly. And is there a reason why that isn't the norm, and is, or could that be more of the norm moving forward so that unions are treated more equitably as these negotiations are? With respect to wages and benefits, I yes. don't think so. Uh, I mean, there, there, there isn't. Uh, the, the mechanism that we used for the health insurance statute has a special provision under mass law to allow that to happen. Uh, and we agreed, both unions and we agreed to use that mechanism to do a coalition type bargaining. I don't believe there's any interest on the part of the unions, nor, nor do I know of any mechanism why we would all bargain 
as a group over wages and benefits. Uh, they're separate bargaining units by choice and by agreement of the city, and they think they're pretty jealous of the right of each of these unions to bargain on its own merits and for its own needs. Um, there is some element of what you're describing in that early settlements by big unions tend to have a lot of influence on the other unions. Early, early settlements by smaller unions have less of an influence, but they are informative to other unions as to what the city is willing to do. So some part of that takes place. Uh, but you know, I'm, I'm open to anybody coming up with a suggestion to say, let's bargain wages and benefits on a coalition basis, but I really don't see a mechanism for doing it. And it's not always wise because each of these unions has elements that are non-wage issues in their contracts, which we ought to be looking at in the context of doing wage benefit negotiation because we may want to look for some kind of an exchange if you're going to give a percent here we want something over there that's awfully hard to do in a coalition setting because it's just much more complicated than just the issue of health insurance mm -hmm. uh, and, and if this decision isn't made tonight what's the process moving forward How does that impact? Uh, well this council has the authority to make this decision through the end of its term mm -hmm. so at some point you'll have to make the decision or else your your authority this particular body's authority to make the decision will go away i don't think there's anything under the uh, laws that compel action by the city council you're an independent uh, decision maker in this and so you know you, you can decide you can postpone you can reduce you can reject all of those things but i don't i don't know that there's anything that compels you to act okay thank you Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Yeah, Councilor Brophy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Condon. Um, in regards to the other unions who settled for um, the, the zero zero in the two fiscal years, um, do any of those contracts contain a reopener if another union settles for those? They don't contain reopeners, Councilor. However, they all expired. Those contracts were through June 30 of 2013. So we're back at the table with all of them, and all of them feel that if this is funded, then something is due to them because they didn't settle on the same basis. Yeah, I noticed in your re recommendation you indicated because the other unions did not receive that retroactivity, they will undoubtedly seek to recover the difference in bargaining for the FY14 through F FY16 contracts. So what that, that kind of has the same um, financial impact as a reopener would. Um, and yeah, because the contract has just expired. If the, con if the contract were, were still in force for a year or, two, or a year or two to go, there isn't a reopener in it, but there is no, there is no reopener, but also the contract's expired. What is the potential liability? to uh, the financial not, liability? Not if nearly as large as this because they've already been complicated compensated for more than half of what this contract has and in the city's um, compensation structure about three-quarters of the cost are in the fire and police budgets so for those other unions it, it, it'll be hundreds of thousands of dollars but not nearly as much as this okay uh, could you uh, before Monday night, just give us some estimates, high and low, what you think it could be. Yeah, I'd be reluctant because I, I don't know. If, if we get back to the table with them, I don't know how much we would agree to because we have no obligation to agree. I mean, it would be a, a bone of contention. Uh, and there's also an issue of when would we put it into those contracts? How would we structure it? But I, I can tell you what, not saying what we would do, but right. what the impact would be had we done just to make well, it Well, yeah, the impact would be less, obviously, because they had received one fiscal year uh, and um, uh, uh, in, in regards to um, payment, and you're right, it's, it's not as big a cost as the right. police or fire. Um, but it is something in, in determining the cost of this contract we need to consider. Okay. We are, I'm glad you mentioned that. I was, I, obviously, I was going to ask you about that, yep. the fact that th we, we do, this is another financial um, costs that we have to attach to this agreement. Yep. Um, in discussing, um, I'd like to discuss the issue on um, the Joint Labor Management Committee. Um, the, the, the mayor mem mentioned that it's been referenced um, several times that uh, they're going to look at uh, other communities uh, in regards to what they pay their fire department and also look at what the city did. And, and the, the Brockton Education Association's agreement uh, has been mentioned as, that, that, as probably going to uh, put us on the hook for this contract. I and mean, you said critical care uh, unions, that they, they look at the uh, BEA as a critical union, uh, need union. 
the other unions that settled, um, you, you were nice enough to put a little um, uh, explanation of each of those. Um, would the Joint Labor Management Committee, however, consider those agreements that the city, for, for the majority of its contract, and keeping in mind, too, one of the unions in that group is the, um, is the uh, police, police supervisors, supervisors That's correct. which is, would be considered a critical union, yes. did not receive zero, zero in two years. Is that something that they would, cons that, that, that the, the uh, uh, JLMC would consider? Yes, I believe it is. Okay. Now, you said that this, uh, um, our moving forward, and this is based on, on the recommendation of Labor Council, did we seek a second opinion? Did they take that into consideration that that union is also a critical need union in making their I, recommendations? I believe so. We, we, we talked both with uh, you know, our own in-house in attorneys and with outside counsel, which has typically represented us in the past with um, uh, public safety unions. And, and the, rec recommend, the recommendation simply was that the JLMC will look at all of these issues. That, that was his point. And the other point that was especially crucial, though, had less to do with the economics and more to do with the impact of the language change, where in that particular instance, the, there was already precedence in JLMC decisions that a 24-hour uh, schedule would be imposed on the city because it wasn't looked at as being an economic, and so we wanted to have some say over how that was imposed, what manner it was imposed, what protections the city had. So we were we were cognizant of that as we came to this agreement. And in that case, we were advised that the not not going uh, and coming to agreement on that would leave us exposed to getting something imposed on us. I want to come back to that, but you mentioned the change in the work schedule. Um, was that a, a, a provision that the union insisted on, or was it a city position? It was the union's position. Okay. And so could you explain uh, in more detail the rationale for the city in, in, in accepting that and uh, how it affected the, the, the financial settlement? Well, um, there wasn't a direct link financially, uh, but it was a proposal that for a long time it was never withdrawn. In these negotiations, there are proposals which are initially put on the table, and, and over the course of bargaining, some get pulled off the table so you can focus on the less and uh, the more important and get rid of the less important ones. Uh, this, propose, this proposal remained on the table. Uh, the city had suggestions with respect to doing it in a different way, perhaps with a trial period, but the union was pretty insistent that in some fashion they had to get to an agreement on a 24-hour work schedule. Uh, and so we bargained for a long time over, over exactly how that would get Im, 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 imposed on or, or agreed to. But it was a union's, it was a union's <coughs> proposal. And, but, but it wasn't given any consideration as to the financial package that, that, that the, the, their insisting on that would, it would uh, be a benefit to the city and decrease well, the Well, not in a direct sense, but the city's position was that you're getting something that's very important to you here, and we think that uh, you know, that ought to be acknowledged indirectly or as a part of the agreement that as to how we come to the financial settlement. But there wasn't a direct link for this than that, that that didn't occur. Um, one of the things when, years ago when the, the residency was um, was negotiated, I felt that the, that had a, a price tag and I felt that we didn't get the, our money's worth for, for that negotiation. Are we getting our money's worth with the, with uh, with this negotiation on the on the uh, on the um, schedule change on the 24 schedule, I, I think we're protected on it because the the language provides that if certain kinds of uh, uh, actions incur, occur, especially say a higher use of sick days, and we've got a measurement in there for that, that if those kinds of costs to the city increase because a higher use of sick days would re result in higher overtime costs to maintain the same level of staffing. There is a protection on that, and, and that's what we focused on as opposed to a direct wage offset. Uh, I'd like to ask the chief his opinion on, on this, uh, whether or not this is something that is, is going to uh, impact the uh, department and the running of the department. Uh, can it be implemented safely? Uh, I noticed that there is a provision in the contract where the chief has the right to revert upon notice on, on the chief's discretion back to the old schedule. So if, before going forward on this uh, vote on this co the funding of this contract, if the chief could tell us uh, what he feels the schedule, how it's going to affect the department. If, he, if you can, chief. Good evening, counselors. 
Um, this one issue is probably the most contentious issue uh, through the negotiating process. Uh, everything in the contract has value. Obviously, this had value. So it either comes down to money or we do the work schedule. Um, <clears throat> the work schedule, um, <clears throat> I believe that um, I can implement it in a, in a way that it'll work. I have safeguards built into there on the sick leave and stuff. Um, anybody that was in that room knows how adamant I was on the, uh, <clears throat> on, the, on the safety measures that were put in there. And um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> this, this type of work schedule is almost every department in the state has it. Um, <clears throat> I've held out a long time on it. Um, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, <clears throat> it. It changes, it just, it, it changes the work schedule, it changes some of the, some of the dynamics. Um, but it's manageable and, uh, um, you know, if we hadn't agreed to it, um, I don't know where we would, where we would have gone from there. So uh, they wanted one schedule, I wanted another. Um, we dug in our heels and we ended up with a middle of the road schedule that we could both live with. So uh, this schedule and the agreement, the, 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 the provision that allows you upon notice on your sole discretion to revert to the old schedule, you, you, you feel that that's a safeguard? I mean, I value your opinion on this. And I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the, you know, yes, the effectiveness what it, of, the, uh, what of it, the department. Go ahead, Chief. What I did is, is we, we implemented, uh, we came up with a, with a uh, <clears throat> methodology on, uh, on sick leave. If the sick leave goes above a certain level over an 18 month period, I have the option to turn around and bring the union <clears throat> and notify them that we're going back to the other schedule. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, it also turns around, I think a, a strong point in, in maybe in favor of it is the fact that it's the responsibility of the union to police their members to make sure that they don't exceed that level. What, what is the responsibility of the union in that regards? Well, the thing is, is this, is, is um, <clears throat> um, if, we, if we go above the, if we, if we go above the, the, uh, the number of sick days over that extended period, I can revert back to the old schedule. So consequently, it's in everybody's best interest to come to work. I understand, yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Chief. Thanks for that. Mr. Condon, if um, I, I would be interested uh, in, in, in uh, just shoring up uh, before the final vote on Monday, uh, the, the assurances. I know that in, in past agreements, there were reopeners uh, and make sure that that is not an issue. And also uh, to confirm with the um, outside counsel, it's something in writing for us, their, their reasons for uh, why they feel that this is in the best interest of the city, why uh, the, this settlement, this uh, contract is in the best interest of the city as opposed to going before the, um, uh, before going to arbitration, the mandatory arbitration. Okay. Uh, I, I, can, I can assure you now that there are no reopeners, but I'll get that to you in, 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 in writing for, the, for that meeting. I'll attempt to get some kind of a, a letter, or the city solicitor's office can, from, uh, from our outside labor council. Uh, but we did, we did confer with them. I'll, I'll attempt to get that for you. Uh, I, I received a note um, uh, from the other members of the negotiating team. There were two points I think I ought to make about the question about the uh, wage bargaining versus the 24-hour schedule. The first was that the city insisted that there be no additional cost on it. And the second is that uh, in the end, coming to settlement, the last year was in dispute, and we insisted we wouldn't go any higher. And if you remember, the last year is less than 2%. And our argument for that was you've already gotten something pretty important here in the 24-hour schedule. So, so there, was, was, there wasn't a direct linkage, but it was a part of the bargaining so process. So there was, in a way, a financial incentive. Yes. Okay. yes. Thank you so much, Mr. Conn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Mayor, um, first of all, I want to, uh, I want to thank you uh, for bringing this before us tonight. Um, you know, I've, I've sat at the table of a negotiation in a different municipality, and it's contentious, and it's heated, uh, and it's give and take, and that's what negotiation's about. So could you just, Madam Mayor, could you just tell us who it is that sits on the negotiation team for the City of Brockton side? On the city of Brockton side, it's Mr. Condon, Ms. Cruz, uh, a representative from the Law Department. It's either Attorney Leach or Attorney Federoff. 
Um, and at points of this negotiation, the fire chief was involved. Okay. And, and who is the outside counsel that the city uses that Mr. Connor was referencing? Um, oh, Phil Collins. Okay. It was Phil, Attorney Phil Collins. Phil Collins. Okay. Um, I mean, this is collective bargaining counselors. We, we discussed this months ago on the health insurance, and we were adamant that the, we, we did not want the forced change of health insurance because the basis of collective bargaining is two parties sit down at a table and they hammer it out. We're the legislative body. We appropriate, but we're not at that table. So I support this 100%. Um, you know, we, we have to make sure public safety is at the forefront of the city of Brockton. These men and women, they, they sacrifice their lives every day. Look at Arthur Street recently. Some crazy nut arsonist, you know, almost killed people. And uh, they went in there without hesitation. So I support this. I do have reservations about the stabilization. Um, you know, if we have a bad winter, we're going to be uh, in a lot of trouble, I think, financially. But, Mr. Conan, in terms of how that impacts the bond rating, drawing from the stabilization and drawing it down, can you just give us worst-case scenario what would happen on that? Uh, well, we've, we've got issues with the bond rating agencies in any case. Um, uh, I don't mean to be, be critical of the council, but they don't like the city not using the full 2.5%. That, that's something they don't, they, they don't particularly They can stick for. it, though, on that. That's up to yeah, us. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I mean, that's the city's de decision, but from their perspective, it's not a good thing. Um, we have some things going for us, which are pretty strong uh, in terms of reserves going in. We're not over-reserved, but for a city like Brockton, we look pretty good. Okay. Uh, debt burden is reasonable. That's pretty good. Uh, the city's financial performance over the years, we've had councils and mayors which have been attentive to issues of fiscal stability. I think the CFO office itself is something they, they like. So all of those things work in our favor. Uh, and at this moment, we've raised the stabilization fund over the last five years from a little over two million back up to six. They like that. Now we're going to bring it back down. We're going in the opposite direction. They won't like that. There also is an issue now with all of these agencies at looking at uh, in light of the new um, market environment since the collapse of 2008 and what's come back since then, um, what is the assumption in your pension funding system with respect to market earnings? Most municipalities are assuming about 8%. Over a long, long history, it was a pretty reasonable assumption. You can look back 100 years, and equities markets would do better than 8%. You don't have 100% of your assets invested in equities. Some are invested in fixed income securities. Well, right now, you can't make any money anywhere in fixed right. income securities. So uh, they're looking for the assumptions on that to come down. If you recost our liability at a lower investment earnings, that liability will explode from the roughly little over $100 million that it is right now. And when that happens, they'll take a look at what will the impact be on a budget to have to service the increased appropriations each year to get there. So all of those things come into play, but this taken in and of itself to reduce the level of reserve fund in order to pay for an ongoing cost will not be looked at favorably unless we had a strategy that said, and this used to be our strategy, we, we've got that, uh, that bank so that we can pull from it in order to fund a contract like this because we don't want to have what we're willing to give in the budget so the unions can say, well, I got a million in the budget, that's our floor, we should be able to budget up from that. Uh, by taking it out of the stabilization, it works to prevent that, but we've always replaced it. And we don't really have a way of getting back that money right now, uh, especially if the city council won't, won't fully appropriate uh, to the two and a half. There's no way right. to replace okay. it. So that here's the negative. Yeah, no, that answers that question. And, and Jay, so you, you sat at the table, not to disclose any privy information, but I, I mean, it's a good faith bargaining. That's yes. bottom line what it was. And you, and you yes. got some stuff you wanted and you didn't always get what you wanted. But yes. I, I'm really happy to hear that the chief was, uh, was at the table at times too, and I'm glad Councilor. Almost, almost every day, Councilor. Yeah, and that's, that's invaluable. And I'm glad uh, Councilor Brophy brought up the, the, the point about the, uh, the reopener clause. I think that's important. Um, I don't think we should delay on this. Um, the fact is, um, a deal has been struck, you know, the parties have, have the meeting of the minds, as they say. So um, I'm going to support this, councilors. I hope uh, it's a favorable recommendation going forward. Again, we're the legislative body. We don't sit at the table. We might have done it differently, but we're not the mayor. So with that being said, I, uh, I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. And uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Rianeri. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Condon. I know the mayor um, mentioned earlier about the, the teacher's contract, and it um, sort of like in one ear and went out the other, but um, they're complete. Am I right, the teacher's contract? 
I think they're going back to the table in the spring because their last year will expire in the year that we're in. They're in the last year of that contract. Okay, okay Mayor, I see the Mayor in back. Sorry, sorry. The teachers will be going back to the table. They will be going back to the table? Okay. Um, and, and they're going back to the table and then police are still at the table, correct? We're at the table with the police right now. Okay. Um, I, I, I know and I know people don't like to hear my history lesson, but I know when I said as a member of the Brockton School Committee, one thing you do as a school committee member is you sit at the table and, you, and you're negotiating. Jay, you and I know we, we spent sometimes seven at night and we left at three in the, the next morning because we had to hash something out. That was, a, that was I guess, the, uh, the task of being on the school committee because you were part of that, that negotiation, that whole team, um, you know, representing the, uh, the city. And it was always amazing to me that when we were there, what did we always hear? What are the police doing? What are the fire doing? Let's summarize, you know, our job compared to theirs, which I never knew how they, you know, compare that apple, but, but that's what we used to go through. Um, and, it's, and it's grinding, and it takes a lot of time to get to that final um, point to where you can say that you have an agreement. I think what I see here is the fact that people worked hard for the last few years to try to put something together. Um, to try to make sure that, that everybody was agreeable to. Yes, it does get contentious at some points, I, I understand that. But at the same token, I look at the fact that um, it's a service that, that I want, not only I, but it's a service that I want my people of my ward and the, and the people of the city of Brockton to have. I, I get very concerned, and will be concerned, if we ever had to go to the arbitration route, because having been there before, and we had contracts that went to arbitration, and we were lucky, we won. You know, teacher contracts, you know, we, when I say we, were able to prevail. Had we not, it would have been another cost factor that would have been imposed to the city of Brockton and to the educational system. Right. But same thing here, another cost that would be imposed, um, you know, to the city of Brockton. So all in all, I, I mean, I wholeheartedly support what, is, what has been done here. Sure, and I echo some of the same things my, my colleague at large Sullivan just mentioned. Have great concerns about the cost in, in, in using the stabilization account. And I know some members of, of the council even mentioned that, and, and it was even printed that, you know, nobody knew that we may be using the stabilization account, but yet the mayor mentioned that to us yeah. at her public hearing when we were preparing the budget, that we were not going to use stabilization to balance the budget because we didn't know where we were at with police and fire contracts. Right. So, um, that, I mean, I've corrected that many times in the last few weeks when I've heard that from some people. But in any case, um, and I don't want to babble, but in any case, I, I support what you've done. I support what both parties have done, and, and I wholeheartedly support, and hopefully the council will stand behind it as well so that we can move this thing forward because I think it needs, it needs to be done so that these people are given the, uh, the right due for, for what they did at the, uh, the table. So, um, I mean, that's all I have to say. No further Thank questions. you, Councilor. If, if I, if I appreciate, appreciate your support. Appreciate both I parties. want to make one comment on the contention uh, uh, because we've said it several times tonight and it's true, but uh, this contention was issues-based. It was never personal. Right. You know, I, I would think both sides would say it was never a personal problem. It was always how do we get to agreement on issues and can we or can't we? Right. But I don't want people to think that we were yelling at them and they were yelling at us. No, no, and, 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 I, and, and I understand what you're saying because I understand how content, but, but in, in, in negotiations, it's never personal. It's we need, to get, we need to get to the root of what we have to do so that we can continue to move forward. And, and I understand that too. So Just, you know, I want to make sure people who are listening yep. to this don't think that the fire department was on a personal mm -hmm. attack or we were, there were no, on, no, the There case. were no medical calls made. Right. I mean, it was just okay. <laughs> but anyhow, I mean, I support what's what's here before me, and I have all. I'm I'm, I'm going to support it, and and I appreciate what both parties have done, and the mayor and her step, all of you. As I appreciate, you know, getting the job done because I think it's well overdue. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Dubois. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Condon. Good so, in your letter, it said that you only certify this expense for one year. Am I yes. correct? So, what happens next year? Well, next year we'll see. Uh, right now, there isn't a mechanism with the present revenue structure to pay for this cost plus the other costs that might come about as a result of the consequences that Councilor Brophy and I were talking about. It may be that we have to pay for some of this in the su subsequent years with fewer workers. That, that's that's no, what I meant. I guess what I'm saying is, so the retroactive pay is coming out of the stabilization mm -hmm. fund, and that isn't going, 
Well, that is going to affect the future because the person's salary has been raised by that much and any future increase is going to be raised on top of that. So if, we, if, you're, only, if you're only certifying this for one year, which I, I didn't even know that that was possible because, I mean, we couldn't write off debt in a water department on fraudulent bills when there was an enterprise account to pay for them because you didn't know if you could afford it. But we know that you can't, we can't afford this after this year, so how are we going to pay for it? Are we going to lay off staff? I mean, you, you're thinking more than a year ahead. I know you are. So what are we going to do next year? Well, I, what I think is, I said in my letter, you'll either need additional revenue sources. There are ways to do that. You may not like it, but there are ways to do it. Or we will have to hope that the state comes back in with aid that they've taken from us, but used to be ours. Or we will have to take uh, some of this cost out in the staffing levels. That's what I meant How by much? it. That's my concern. I, I don't much? know yet, because I'm not in next year's budget. See, that's what gets me. I feel like, you know, I. I I don't want to come off as negative, but I feel like you do know, because you're an intelligent man, you're the CFO of the city, that you kind of probably have more of an idea than most of us in this room how much money is going to be there next year and what we're going to do if, if none of these other um, funding sources come through. So if, if we are going to give, what, did you say 8% pay raise over the, over the life of this uh, contract? Did you say 8? And then I heard you say 20 at one point. 12%. 12%. What is the percentage over the six years? What I said was that the dollar payment to the firefighters, because of the settlement pattern of a bunch of twos, which are retroactive, is 20% right now, because they had none of it in their pocket yet. On the basis of the rate of pay that they get paid, the increase is going to be about 6% that when, it's, when it's finally realized for each of the two contracts, and 12% in total. Okay, and we're taking out more than a million dollars from the stabilization account for the retro, and then more than a million for the moving forward contract. Is that correct? Well, the first appropriation covers the three years that are gone, yep. and the second appropriation covers the cost of the first contract plus the second contract for the year coming up, the year we're in. And so next year, so we're going to have around, how much will we have left in the stabilization account? If well, we haven't got through the winter yet, and we haven't got through negotiations with the police department. Well, I just mean after, to, after next week, if this is all approved and we move all this money out, how much About will be left? Million. About two and a half million. Mm -hmm. So then we have the other contracts to settle, and then we might have a bad winter, mm -hmm. and who knows what else is going to happen. And so then next year, we're going to have um, all the city employees are going to have their three year contracts, which is going to be great because I like unions and I yep. think people deserve to have contracts and stability. But then what are we going to do when we have no more money in the stabilization account? We've promised all, uh, raises to all the city employees. Who are we going to lay off? What fire stations are we going to shut down? Well, that's not a decision that needs to be made at this time, nor is it my decision to make, Councillor. All I'm saying to you is that my view is that the circumstances, the fiscal circumstances of the city are such that this contract has some level of jeopardy for the provision of the current level of services into the future. We're specifically, if we have to make layoffs, that will occur. That will be the mayor's decision at the time when she's made, making a budget up. She's not making that budget up right now. I just wish that there was some kind of three-year projection out. I just, and I don't believe that it doesn't exist. I mean, there's got to be some kind of projection moving forward to show we might be $800,000 short in two years, or we may be $500,000 short in, in two years. And you, so you we tell me what the assumptions would be on that projection, and whether you want to assume local aid going up or local aid going down, or whether you want to assume a continuation of $5 million snow removal cost or a $2 million snow cost. And those variables are so great, they drive the entire process. Yeah. You know, but I, I think we're looking at a substantial now substantial funding problem for next year. We do every year. Oftentimes we find a way to fix it. Sometimes you have to go to the union and say, can we defer some of these costs? That's a possibility, but it's not a thing we're going to ask them to do now because there's no need to do that now. What you have in front of you now is fiscal 14. Massachusetts doesn't do three-year budgeting. You're right, we do, we do projections. I do them all the time. However, they're just assumption-based spreadsheets, nothing more than that. They aren't real until we get into the year we're dealing with. Yeah. Well, you know, it's just difficult. I mean, I'm going to support this because 
you know, what are you going to do? You're going to vote against firefighters? You're going to vote against someone's safety? It's not going to happen. So I understand where I'm at right now, but it's just difficult because we have a park department that has like two people running it, and we have all these other departments that are so understaffed in a police department that's significantly understaffed with a huge crime rate and we're just we're just throwing this money out and I understand that the people here deserve it but it is a very it's a very frustrating situation that we're in I would agree with that and I, I just I just can't stand it so I would agree with that so that's my one question my next thank you very much for your answer and my next question is for Chief Francis Evening, Council. Hi. So what are you going to do if there are three fires in a day and they're all major fires and you have one crew of people working 24-hour shifts? How is that person that fights the first fire at 10 a.m. really going to be physically ready to fight another fire at 2 p.m. or another fire at 10 p.m.? At what point is that firefighter's life in jeopardy because we are putting them out there in five or six fires? So my house burnt down. I know it's not easy. So what happens? How is that safe? Well, what would you do? <clears throat> The information, the research that I did on these shifts, um, <clears throat> the possibility of, of having that type of situation is, is very, very remote. Um, <clears throat> the firefighters have assured me that they'll be able to handle anything that comes their way. And I, I know don't they believe will. that. No offense to all you gentlemen, but any hu or, or ladies, but any human being, if you have to fight three fires or run three marathons in a week, you're going to be inhibited. I, I don't think I'm irrational saying well, that. Please. Counselor, you know, the thing is, is we've also, we, we handle multiple incidents in a, in a, in a 10 hour day or 14 hour sure. night. And I mean, we, we get through it. I mean, every other community around us has these type of shifts. And you know so what? I guess the answer I'm looking for is that I was looking for you thought it, like this has been discussed and that if you were to have this tragic event where you had multiple serious fires that there's some understanding with the fire department that you wouldn't be sending like a 55 year old person who's already fought two fires into a third fire at 10 p.m. right before his shift ends and that you'd be calling somebody else in. Would you not be doing that? Is there any agreement that if you think think that someone has been put in too much jeopardy or if has exhausted himself that you would have a replacement person come in or has that not been discussed I'm just wondering well I, uh, I always have different scenarios in my mind of how to do different things um, that's a possibility also depends what I have for money available to do that type of thing mm -hmm. um, also understand something um, with the staffing levels we have I mean we're able to turn around and uh, try to knock a fire down very quickly. If it's of any substantial size, like the, uh, <clears throat> like the, the uh, building we had a couple of weeks down on Montal Street, yeah. the Brockton Fire Department isn't going to be able to handle it by itself. Okay. By no means, shape, and form, not with the staffing levels we have. Yeah. Okay, so you would be getting um, aid from other communities right. to come in at that point. And is that your call at that decision? Yes. Okay, great. All right, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor DiNapoli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chief, can I get you up there? Well, you know, you, you did a fine, you, Chief, you're doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, you Councilor. Answer, you answered all the questions, you get an A for the test, that's for sure. First of all, uh, I want to congratulate the uh, negotiation teams, and like Councilors uh, Bob Sullivan mentioned earlier, we're here to, uh, to, to approve this contract, and I've always supported the fire department, and all of us sitting up here, public safety is the number one issue. You know, and the chief runs the department, <coughs> and he runs the department the way he sees fit. And I want to congratulate you on the fine job you're doing because you've got a great team behind you. And I support this 100%. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Please sit down. Councilor Monaghan. No, no. Just, it's at the motion. Uh, to I actually know oh, there's a couple more people. Okay, go ahead. Councilor Stewart. Uh, great. Uh, Chief Francis, a question. Um, so the 
$3.6 million uh, that we're looking to uh, take to fund this contract. Uh, I think the mayor mentioned that you either fund it or you, or maybe it was the CFO, or you look at service reductions to cover the cost. So if people are interested in having these, having the pay raises and for us to cover the cost without impacting the stabilization fund, we were talking about uh, staff reductions, I guess. What would that look like? It basically it comes down to uh, what you provide me with, with the funds to, uh, to run the uh, department with. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you, um, <clears throat> I, I, and that's what I do now. I mean, I run nine companies uh, with all the stations open with the funding you provide me. If you provide me with less funding, then I have to look at other options, mm -hmm. which could be closing a station, closing company. It all depends. I see. So um, unlike, I mean, I hate to say this, but unlike my colleagues, I don't think I can support voting for this tonight based on the information that I have. And I um, have a question for the CFO, actually. And, um, because what Councilor Lebois mentioned um, is, I think, is a legitimate question, which is, so the, we're, we, we're t taking this out of the stabilization fund, we're going to be at $2 million in the fund, yet we're still negotiating right. and negotiating with the police department, who would likely want a similar agreement, is yes. what I'm gleaming from this conversation. If that agreement were similar, what would that cost be, approximately? Um, it would be two-thirds of it, probably may pretty much re remove the stabilization fund. Altogether. Yeah. Because a portion of that union is already settled. That's, that was my, my thinking, looking at this. Um, I, mean, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I obviously, and it's very difficult to have this conversation with people who I know in the audience and who I've supported, but I would like to, um, to see what those projections look like in the, in the next year before taking this move to vote on this tonight. There seems to be no um, pressing issue to vote on this until, I mean, we may have the votes already, so that my, my comments may be um, mm -hmm. not that helpful to begin with, but I'd like the motion to have us look at what, how this impacts the city in the next year, maybe two years, in the upcoming um, negotiations, and have the information from the CFO's office before we vote on this. Second. Excuse me, so wait a minute, what's your motion? Uh, the motion is to postpone and have us get additional information from the CFO about how this impacts the city's finances in the next fiscal year. Motion is to postpone. Yes. Motion is made and seconded to postpone. All those in on favor? The on the motion. If I may ask a question to Mr. Condon. Yeah, on the motion. Could you, you get that information to us on Monday? I don't know how useful it would be, Councilor, because it would be so assumption dependent. I can remember when we were talking about the health insurance issue and how we would have had several million dollars worth of savings had we done it and would have gone a long ways toward addressing a, a deficit. That deficit was ridiculed and criticized over the, over the months sub subsequent to that because it didn't fully materialize. My reluctance in doing this is to say, if I put a number out there in front of you, the numbers remembered, the assumptions underlying it is for, are forgotten, and then all of a sudden you're either playing scare tactics or you're not talking about the reality of it. So that's my concern. It, it, I think you know from what I've said that absent change, this contract will cause serious problems in the uh, addressing of next year's fiscal budget. However, we don't know that if that kind of problem emerges, we can't work with the fire department members to find a way to ameliorate that so that there aren't 20 layoffs in the fire department. That's the kind of thing that won't be in that assumption. And it makes the information, to me, somewhat suspect because it is rigid. This is the number. And all the assumptions in there may not be so rigid. The number derives from those, those assumptions. So what I'm saying to you is, if that's the council's vote, then obviously I'll comply with it. But I don't know what value you'll, you'll have in it, because at the end of the day, you won't really know whether that number is the number that faces us come next spring, or if there aren't things other than simple layoffs that could be done to address it. So you've stated the reality that there could be uh, an mm -hmm. impact. Uh, assumptions aren't going to help us with that decision. I mean, that's the reality. Yes. I, I, will, I will also state that uh, the union present here is, has, uh, when there's been a situation where there's going to be layoffs, they've gone back to the table. Every time. To avoid that. Yep. Every time. Yep. And in the last five years, I'd say three or four. Three or four. So there's a history. I don't know whether, because this is a big number, I don't know whether we'd get all the way, I don't know whether we'd get any of the way, I can't say that. But I can say that every time we've needed to deal with them in a way to avoid layoffs in that department, we have found a way to do it. 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Conn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Motion made to second to postpone. All those Mr. in favor? Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Can I, can I make a comment on the motion? On the motion. My motion. Um, so, what, so what I'm hearing tonight is this contract will take the stabilization fund down to $2 million and that likely the negotiations with the police department will take us to a stabilization fund that's zero, yep. and, and we still have these other unions to deal with. Yes. I just can't support that in good faith, um, Mr. Chairperson. Okay, that's not, not in your motion. You yes. made a motion to postpone. Yes. Motion has been made second to postpone. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion does not carry. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to make a favorable recommendation to send this to the full City Council Monday night to 22nd. Second. Second. Uh, before I take your motion, Council Stewart still had the floor. Uh, I'm, I'm fine. Done. Motion was made and seconded to make a favorable recommendation. On the motion, though. On the motion. Uh, Mr. Condon, you can deficit spend snow and ice removal. The OR allows that, right? You're correct in that. It would need to be recovered in fiscal 14. But they do allow it if we need they to draw it. Absolutely. Okay, so long as you're appropriated. Thank this you. Year's loan. Yep. Motion is made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended to the full city council. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor you. Monahan. Councilor Monahan has stayed here. He's supposed to be at work, but he stayed here to get that vote done. Mr. Chairman? Councilor Ianieri. Mr. Chairman, if I might, I'd like to take item number 16 out of order. Second. I... Motion is made and seconded to take item 16 out of order. All those in favor? Opposed? Item 16, Madam Clerk. Resolved that the mayor, the library director, the chairman of the board of library trustees, the superintendent of buildings, and the chairman of the library foundation be invited to appear before a committee of this council to provide information on the planned improvements to the West Branch Library. Invited Honorable Mayor Linda M. Belzotti, Elizabeth Marcus, director of library, James Cassiri, superintendent of public property, Mark Lindy, chairman of the library board, Frederick Howell, president of the library foundation. Uh, thank you. Before we act on this, we're going to take a two minute recess.
We're back in session. Item 16 has been read. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Councilor Ianieri. Mr. Chairman, if I might, I, I filed this, um, this particular uh, resolve, and it was to bring in um, the certain individuals that have been listed um, uh, before us to discuss with us um, the West Branch reno renovations. And I think if you can recall during the budget process, I had some questions and comments in regards um, uh, to this, even when the uh, librarian was present, um, we were talking about it. And, and I think what the, the issue um, that I have here is, is the fact that so many years have gone by since we renovated the East Side Library, which I think was probably about eight, 10 years ago, maybe even a little bit longer and that no renovations were done to the West Side Library. And, it, and that being said, the West Side Library has suffered over the last, um, the last several years because of this. And I know that um, through our building department um, and even having a conversation with the uh, superintendent of buildings that you know, we have done work there um, over the past few years. And I think we even, have even done some work there uh, this year and spent some money. But, but the issue was that there was going to be some money coming from the foundation so that we as a city could do some work and even we as a city would probably see what we could do to you know, find some funds at the same time. And, and that hasn't occurred. So um, I wanted to just bring this before us so that we could just hear what they're trying to do as into the, the Library Foundation or the trustees and even what we're trying to do as, as a city to um, try to get some of these renovations um, down at the West Side Branch Library because uh, we are definitely in need to, to taking care of that building and uh, in no way am I um, looking to uh, have anybody here before us that I'm scolding or, or you know, finger pointing because we're not going to do that. I know the mayor is uh, present and, and if she has anything to any input, I'm sure she'll, uh, she'll definitely let us know as well. But um, I think the first one I just want to hear from is, is the superintendent of, of buildings because he's, he's the one that's been um, trying to spearhead something uh, to get to get done here so that we can get some renovations um, ongoing. So um, I defer to you, uh, Mr. Kassiri. Thank you for being yeah, here. How are you? Good evening, counselors. Um, yeah, the, the West Side Library has uh, in need of uh, a new roof and soffits and some windows and upgrades on the interior and the handicap ramp needs some work. Um, the, the Public Properties Department is the maintenance operation and we don't have funds to to do a construction project on that magnitude. However, we've, we have spent, the city has spent $13,000 on that building this year as of tomorrow. Um, but the library foundation has graciously offered to uh, grant the city $50,000 um, so we can move ahead with some of these uh, badly needed repairs. Okay, so with that being said and that they're um going to give the city that that type of money um, naturally we're not going to be able to do all of what you've even listed am I correct um, well we're going to start with the roof and the soffits and the gutters we're going to try to seal the building up pretty good and hopefully uh, we'll have conversations with them through the mayor's office and the library right. foundation and we'll we'll prioritize what the next phase would be I think probably windows okay uh, the handicap ramp is another thing we have to look at as well um, with that being said, and I'm, I'm not even sure, as, as you know, our finances aren't all that great either, so I haven't had a chance to have any real discussion with the mayor in, in finding a way that maybe there's some other small revenues where we can pitch in as, as well. Mayor, thank you. Well, honestly, Councillor, right now there's no uh, money in terms of for capital projects for anything, including okay. um, roofs that need to be redone at the fire station. Um, what we do plan to do in terms of that um, gift of the, uh, that's graciously coming from the Library Foundation is uh, before you tonight on the agenda you have an item for a um, memorandum of agreement with Massasoit and we're going to develop the same memorandum of agreement and go into it with the Library Foundation as well. So we have an agreement as to um, the, the order of the projects, the priority of the projects and, um, and, see how, and just see how far the money goes. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Kassiri, with, um, again, with the gift of the 50,000 and, and work to be done, um, that would mean that you would be, you would be overseeing this and, and, and the process would be the same as, as we've done with any type of projects through the procurement rules and regulations and, and, Correct. and laws. Correct, prevailing wage, procurement, 
Okay. The whole deal. Yeah. So, so we'd be following that that process. We have no choice. It's Mass General Laws. That's what yeah. we have to do. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, well, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. I mean, it it gets something started, and it, and the same as what the you know the mayor has said. I mean, if 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 anything, the roof is the most important thing because that's the the number one thing that any anyone needs and any house has to have is make sure the roof is in is in order. So I um, I'm pleased to see that. Um, so I appreciate uh, I appreciate uh, you being here as well. And I don't know if somebody from the Library Foundation or the library. Also, just uh, point of information, Mr. Howell is unable to make it. Mr. King is here from the. Uh Okay. Uh, Library Foundation. Great. Thank Good you. E Good evening, Council. Thank you, Mr. King. Anything to be said other than what's been said? Uh, no, that's about it. Um, and it was about seven years ago that the Library Foundation renovated the East Branch Library, and it cost us almost a million dollars. Right. It was built in '69. The there were tw twin libraries, and yeah. Um, the other one hasn't been taken care of, and we'd like to step up to the plate and take and do it. And, and I appreciate that, and, and um, I think all of us know. I mean, even be it a city building, we've been trying to do what we can as well. And, and as you heard the, the mayor, I mean, finances aren't, you know, uh, they're not right there for, for us to do some of the things that we want to do. So, uh, you know, I appreciate it. I appreciate what the foundation is doing, um, be it. The building is in my ward, and be truthful with you. I mean, I'd I'd love to see it open some nights because I I'd love to use it for a ward meeting because it's a great location instead of me having to go to one of the schools. I mean, it's a great spot, um, mm -hmm. and it's right in the heart of everything else that's there. The high school, the is. stadium, the fairgrounds, everything's right there. You know, so um, in, in any case, I appreciate uh, I appreciate what what you people are doing and stepping up to bat and, and and working with the city, working with this building superintendent. And well, we would we would really like to get the um, roof and the buildings secure, sure. yeah. and then go from there and move to the windows okay. if it takes a, a little bit more money, we can do that. Yeah, um, yeah. But as soon as we get these two projects done, we then we want to go on the inside of the building and look at the heating system. Great, great. Heating and air conditioning. Yeah. As those are heaters that they have in the, uh, air conditioners that they have in the windows, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're about ready to yeah, fall out. It, it, they're, they're a done deal. Okay, I, I appreciate it, Mr. King. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I have no other questions, Mr. Chairman. Listen. Some councilors do. Thank you. Councilor Sullivan. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, my colleague from Ward 3 for putting this resolve forward. And, and uh, you know, growing up on, on Ward 2, the West Library, that's where I went. I mean, elementary school, West Junior High, and, and Brock and I. I know Councilor Petty did as well. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's really a gym on the west side of the city. So I want to thank uh, everybody that's involved, you know, the foundation and the board. And, and I know it's difficult, uh, you know, when you volunteer and sometimes is. Uh, differences of opinion, but bottom line is at the end of the day, we want to have a, a great library uh, for the citizens of the city of Brockton. Uh, if I could have uh, the director of library, uh, Elizabeth Marcus, come up, and I, I thank her for being here tonight. Good evening. How are you tonight? Good evening. I'm fine. Thank you. I, I just wanted to, to kind of get your thoughts um, on, on the West Branch Library and, and what you've heard tonight and if you feel comfortable on, on what they're trying to It sounds like it's a Band-Aid approach, but nonetheless, it's it's a, it's a positive step in the right direction. Yes, I agree. Um, the West Branch Library is in desperate need of repair. And certainly the roof is something that needs to be addressed pretty immediately. Mm -hmm. um, the $50,000 um, is not enough, of course, but it is a good start. Yes. Okay. And, and, and what, uh, and shame on me not for knowing this, but what, what are the hours right now at the West Side? What, what, how many days is We're that? We're open, open nine hours a week. We're nine open hours. Monday mornings from 9 a.m. to noon and then Wednesday afternoon through evening from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. And you're still getting a, a good customer flow? We're doing well. There's a little bit of drop off in attendance at West Branch this year. Okay. I just did the uh, statistics for the state report. Are you a seeing a pick off. up at the main library or anything? Yes, the kinda... main library is uh, better attended this year. Also, East Branch is a little better attended. Excellent, okay. I really thank you for what you're doing. And I know Mr. Lindy's here as well. I want to thank him. And with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Mr. Ooh, Chairman. Councilor Petty. Thank you very much. Um, just a general statement to uh, the library director, uh, Mr. Kassiri, and members of the library board. If I can just make one suggestion, and that is easy uh, landscaping maintenance. Um, it, it's an entrance right into the city. It actually needs a new chain link fence. I know that's not high priority right now. But entering the city, you're coming right in, you're bearing right off of uh, 123. Um, if, if, if the whole city could look as well or as good as the War Memorial Building does, 
That's how every municipal building should look. Mm -hmm. I mean, right next to the War Memorial Building is Eldon B. Keith Field, and that field is atrocious. I mean, all you have to do is, all, whoever takes care of the school department or whatever, just edge it along the backstop. It just looks terrible, and, and it could look absolutely beautiful. As I said, as good as the War Memorial Building looks, that's how every city building should look. So when you do work at the West Side Library, whatever shrubs are in front, remove them, put in easy, low maintenance, um, shrubbery and the place will look absolutely beautiful so I hope uh, this gets approved and um, to think of the landscaping as well because that is just as important not as important right now but it will help it uh, in, look, in terms of appearance and uh, make people feel very good about going into a nice well-maintained facility thank you mr. chairman for the time mr. Chairman. thank you that's no, pretty close to on topic. <laughs> Councilor Ian Erie. Mr. Chairman, if I might, I know Council Petty is going to be retired, so he can uh, definitely pitch in with doing some of the maintenance there for us. See? <laughs> I knew he'd say that. Um, I'd like to move for a favorable recommendation Second. back to the full council. Second. Second. Motion made and seconded to recommend this resolve to the full council favorably. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Thank you. Item number 11. Order appropriation of 125,000 from the Massasoit Community College grant for design service for intersection improvement to the DPW project fund for improvements at Crescent Street, Quincy Street, and Massasoit Boulevard. Invited Johnny Conan, Chief Financial Officer, Michael Thorson, Commissioner of Department of Public Works, William Mitchell, VP for Admin, Chief Financial Officer, Massasoit Community College. Good evening, Mr. Thorson. Good evening. Uh, this is a wonderful example of a public-public partnership which was initiated by Mayor Balzati in discussions with Massasoit. This is for the redesign and uh, in, uh, eventual reconstruction of the intersection of Crescent Street, Quincy Street, and Massasoit Boulevard. The mayor and uh, the president of Massasoit, uh, Mr. Wall, have had discussions on this, and they have, they being Massasoit Community College, says has graciously agreed to fund a portion of the design effort to uh, the amount of $125,000, which is uh, the total design cost for this project is uh, 300,000 and they have agreed to fund 125,000 of that monies and that is why uh, we are here tonight. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, uh, the uh, Vice President, Chief Financial Officer of Massasoit uh, Community College is also here. If, if you have any questions for him, I'm sure he's more, more than happy to uh, answer them. Council Brophy, are you all set? All set. Make a favorable recommendation. Second. second. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion is recommended favorably. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Item number 12. Order transfer of $8,250 from the parking meter reserve fees to the parking authority for purchase of services to fund the lease of the property at 46 Montello Street, which will be used to accommodate parking patrons displaced by the Trinity Project. <laughs> Invited John A. Conn, Chief Financial <laughs> Officer. Robert Malley, Executive Director of Parking Authority. I'm okay with that going on the agenda, so I'll try to... Uh, Councilors, I did receive uh, word mm -hmm. Mr. Malley is out of town and sent uh, his regrets that he couldn't be here tonight. And I think Mr. Condon must have not realized this was still on the agenda. Uh, I can... I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, they are doing some work to... Uh, because the city is... Move for favorable recommendation. Second. Second. Using the parking lot for the Trinity construction. Yep. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Item number 13. Order that the City Council accept and expend a donation in the amount of $4,850 from the National Grid for a School Communications Project. The money will be used for a radio equipment upgrade at two of the middle schools. I invited John A. Conan, Chief Financial Officer, Emmanuel C. Gomes, Chief of Police, Joseph Cardinal, Community and Customer Management of National Grid, and or his designee. Well, <laughs> Chairman, I make a favorable recommendation. Second. Second. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably to full city council. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended favorably. Item number 14. Order that the DPW is authorized to issue one sewer connection to the property located at plot 33 North Cary Street, book 43439, page 339, Brockton, Mass. The property is currently owned by Gary 
uh, Lasowitz Trust invited Michael Thorson, Commissioner of the Dep Department of Public Works, and Gary Lasowitz, property owner. Uh, I spoke with the DPW, and this isn't going to affect the sewer system and the intercept up there, so I'm going to move to approve. Second. Second. Thank you. Motion made and seconded to recommend favorably. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommended to the full City Council favorably. Item number 15. Resolved that the representatives of National Grid be invited to appear before a committee of this council to discuss emergency preparedness. Invited Richard C. Francis, Chief of Fire, Emmanuel C. Gomes, Chief of Police, Morton Schaffler, Director of Emergency Management, Joseph Cardinal, Community and Customer Manager of National Grid and, and or his designee. Well, I'd say three of the four people were here. The fourth <laughs> is here. We have the important one here, Mr. Chairman. Oh, my God. Don't know why the other people all left. Mr. Cardinal, hello. Good evening, Mr. Chair and Who fellow councillors. I did, my dear. Councillor Sadensky, thank, thank you. you very much, Councillor um, Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Cardinal. How are you? Nice to meet you in person. Great uh, to meet you too, Councillor. I, I had talked with my, co uh, my colleagues, in particular, uh, Councillor Lodge Sullivan, and we're going into the uh, storm month, I guess I'll call it, <clears throat> the hurricanes, et cetera. And we felt that we should have you in particular come in to try to give us any tips and tell us what's going on as far as your projected plan for outages. Uh, we had some problems. Uh, in fact, I'll start by asking you, Joe, how many crews will be on to well, work? Typically during a, a storm event, every crew is on, um, but that only makes up a small in Brockton. Yes, a small portion of what we have on during storm events. And basically the amount of crews on is determined by what we feel the level of the storm is going to be. So that will be our property because as everybody knows, the Board of Health report came back that said that that was one of the highest areas of um, PM 2.5 in the city. So in February, the DEP came and made the announcement that they were going to grant us the monitor. Um, so to get it done by April would have been a, an ambitious uh, timeline after we found out everything that was involved. So in terms of the, um, the hookup, because it needs electricity, uh, DEP gave the National Grid the notice of the project in, in March. But first, uh, we needed to secure, draw, and draft plans for the easement and the license agreement. And it took about a month to work all of that out, the language, the plots, and coordinating all the work. Uh, this process on every, eas every time you do an easement, it's time consuming. There's legal requirements, there's deeds, and, but this has been actually one of the quickest that's been done. Then um, we went to the Parks Commission and um, got the approval for the license agreement in May. And then the license agreement and easement was approved by the council uh, at the end of that month or the beginning of June and sent to National Grid for execution and to be recorded with the Registry of Deeds. From there, National Grid came in and began digging for the installation of the pole so that the DEP could come back and install the monitor. This happened at the end of July. And then DEP delivered the monitoring station on August 15th. It had to be stored um, somewhere because it couldn't be left on the property unattended. And from there, the electrical work began to hook it up and get it energized. The fencing, then the wiring and the equipment was installed and uh, the synchronization was finished last week. And now currently the monitor is monitoring and taking measurements and DEP is now awaiting for Verizon to go in and install a line so that it can be viewed uh, real time on DEP's website by residents. But it is now working and functioning. And, and thank you for that uh, timeline, Mayor. So, mm -hmm. so when, when was it, uh, when was it uh, monitoring? The month of what? Uh, September was it? Oh, August fifteenth. Uh, you said DEP delivered. Then it was fencing. Yeah, installed. and then it had to be fencing. And what did it actually go on about a week ago, Mike? About a week ago. Yeah, about a week ago. It started monitoring. Okay. Um, well, that you, you definitely answered some of my questions. So when you said the equipment had to be stored, where where, where was it stored? Uh, I actually don't know where DEP stored it, but they hung on to it. Um, originally, on. there was a, originally there was talk of leaving it um, at the site. But that became um, not reasonable because it wasn't fenced and it wasn't protected and it wouldn't make sense to leave it in the open like that. Do, do, we, um, do we have any guesstimate or es expectation of time on Verizon so we can get the online results? I don't know. Do you? Probably by mid next week. Mid next week. 
So you know why we're all concerned about this, and I know you share the feelings, Mayor, is, is the, the really the key months are the summer months, so we right. missed that. I mean, that's out the window, but. But, well, I, then, but there's always next summer. I mean, I, DEP hasn't said how long that, I, I mean, I don't think they have a, a projection of a time frame. I don't think they're gonna shut it off before next summer. Believe me, Councilor, no one wanted it on more than I did. Again, I, unfortunately, again, in my exuberance and not really um, checking the whole um, awarding of it, Sometimes what happens is they award you something and then it, the award sits there for a while and then all of a sudden it's okay, we're here and we're gonna give it to you and all of the, the work that's done or needed to be done ahead of time doesn't always get done. So I, I take full responsibility for being a little anxious and thinking that it could have been um, ready by April. Okay, so, so at least we can report back to the residents, constituents. It's, it's monitoring now, as of right now, about a week ago it started going. Okay. And then, uh, as Mr. Mullins said, maybe mid next week they can do the online, and that's through Verizon. Yeah. And so within, you know, by a month from now, everything's rocking and rolling, right? We have everything going. Exactly. Right. And, um, and they, I, I don't think they should be concerned about, I, I, well, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't phrase it like that. I understand their concerns about that we missed this summer, but DEP hasn't indicated to us that they wouldn't do it through next summer. So there's, you know, we'll still get summer readings. Can, can no you, one's indicated. Can you put that on them and just maybe see if they can get a representation to you as the mayor saying, yes, we'll keep it there through the summer? Sure, we can make that contact. That's and if not you a could just report back to us. Um, Absolutely. I, I, I know, I'm sure Council Stadinsky, through you, Chair, has been getting a lot of calls on this as well, saying what the heck's going on. So this is a great update, May Mayor. I want to thank you. And uh, again, if you could, either through your Chief of Staff or you directly, just report back what DEP says and be optimistic that next summer they'll let it do it as well. And with that, I want to...